but I made the decision to finish the race. And I remember telling my coach that I was going to finish this race on my hands and my knees if I had to. And I knew, I knew then that if I didn't, everybody would believe women were barging into places where they weren't welcome. Welcome to Zestful Aging, where I talk with fascinating, talented, and influential guests who reflect on the adventures and challenges of aging and who are living their lives with vibrance and purpose. I'm your host, Nicole Christina, psychotherapist, writer, and Zestful Ager. And if you like this podcast, you'll love my companion course, Zestful Aging, Simple and Sustainable Habits for Health and Longevity. You'll have access to what I've learned from being a psychotherapist for 30 years and the latest research on what habits really matter and contribute to vibrant aging. Find out more at NicoleChristina.com. Last week, we spoke with Jillian Walness Perry, the author of The Legacy of Anne Frank, which was is just a timely and moving book. And we talked about confronting discrimination and sharing the message of tolerance and kindness throughout the world. And next week, we're going to speak with Jolene Hill. Her motto is, life is short, so let's talk. And she's developed these really innovative conversation cards. They're actually beautiful, and they're used all over the world in different clinics to help people with dementia and other cognitive decline start conversations. Well, I have my Jack Russell Terrier Sparky beside me, my coffee in my hand, so let's begin. In 1967, Catherine Switzer was the first woman to officially run what was then the all-male Boston Marathon, infuriating one of her events directors who attempted to violently eject her. In one of the most iconic sports moments, Switzer escaped and finished the race. Now a spokesperson for Adidas, Switzer is also the founder of 261 Fearless, a foundation dedicated to creating opportunities for women on all fronts, as this groundbreaking sports hero has done throughout her life. Welcome to the show, Catherine. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. I am too. We've been kind of crisscrossing the country together, but not seeing each other. I know you were out at the National Senior Games in Albuquerque, as I was uh, last week, and you have had uh, you have been a student at Syracuse University, and I I think that you've also received an honorary doctorate, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Nicole, I mean, that's really terrific. Uh, First of all, uh, at the National Senior Games, it was just a wonderful experience. We can talk about that in a moment because I know that aging is a a dilemma for most people. Um, And that was a really validating experience about aging. Um, And also, we are from the same area. Um, My origins in running began in Syracuse, New York, Mm -hmm. because I was a student there. And yes, you're right, in 2000. And uh, 18, I was the commencement speaker Ah. at my alma mater, Syracuse University, and was awarded an honorary doctorate. And I got to tell you, that was that was a really great aging experience because I could never have imagined in a million years, 50 years before, that I would be the commencement speaker at Syracuse Mm -hmm. University. When I sat there in the audience waiting for my diploma. You know, I, the last thing that ever would occur to me is that I would be walking across that stage speaking to 17,000 graduating students. <laughs> and, and it really, it's not because you are a fantastic athlete. There are many fantastic athletes. A lot of this had to do with what happened to you at the Boston Marathon. It definitely is true, Nicole. Um, And the reason the students themselves voted for me to be the speaker was because in this amazing year of women, 
um, everything from Me Too to Time's Up to women getting into politics and demanding equal rights. Um, men and women alike, at, at, certainly at Syracuse University, um, said we, we want one of ours who has gone beyond sports and has changed the face of women and has changed the face of our society. And I was so flattered. I was just, it was a very validating experience. And so would we have known, if we would have known Catherine Switzer as a, let's say, middle school student, high school student, that you were going to be a woman who broke boundaries for women all across the globe? Would we have guessed that? No, we wouldn't have guessed that. And Catherine herself would never have guessed it about <laughs> herself. But I'll tell you one thing that it, that is true about me um, is that ever since I was very, very young, um, I was taught and then had sort of an innate sense of responsibility. And I always felt and was told, if you do something, you've got to follow up on it and you've got to make it good and you've got to um, pay the price. Oh. Uh, sleep in your bed if you made it, you know, <laughs> all those kinds of things. Um, and I knew after the incident in the Boston Marathon, which you, you said at the beginning, re retold, um, I felt very responsible for helping other women and very, very responsible for changing the situation. And, and it, and it has worked out. So I think from that point of view, people would have said, well, she's very dependable and very persistent and very conscientious, even mm. as a young girl. So I'm trying I'm trying to picture this cuz this is just so incredible. So you you knew that you could not represent yourself as the woman you were. So you how did you uh actually physically prepare for the race other than the athletic part? Well, this is a fun story. First of all, I began running when I was 12. My father and mother were great inspirations to me. I'm very, very blessed to have had such good role models as parents. But my father was the one who was gung-ho, you can do it. He said, listen, uh, you should run a mile a day and you could make the field hockey team in your high school. And I was only 12 and starting school early. And it was really a nervous time for me. So I ran this mile a day. And what happened is, yes, I made the field hockey team and that gave me tremendous confidence. But what made me feel fearless and empowered and, and validated and full of self-esteem was the mile I ran every day. It was like um, having a victory under my belt that nobody could take away from me. You kind uh, of banked it. It. I did. I banked it. I, I often call it building a brick wall. Every day is another brick in this great, wonderful wall. And um, and I felt, you know, some days easy, some days are impossible, but I did it. Anyway, that love of running stuck with me to university time. And when I realized when I went to Syracuse, there were no girls sports, no women's sports whatsoever. Um, intramurals. Uh, play days. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, and I wanted to run. And I thought, well, at least I can run by myself. But I, I was really strong willed. And I went in and I talked to the men's track coach and asked him if I couldn't run on the men's team. And he said, no, that's against NCAA rules. But we would welcome you if you wanted to come and work out with the team train with them. Well, he never thought that I would show up. He would never thought that I would show up. <laughs> and I did. I showed up. And the guys were wonderful. So this is an important part of the story. This is very important. This is like a, a really pivotal part of the story. Yeah. Because if it had been football or lacrosse or something, the guys would have laughed me off the field. These guys said, sure, run with us. It's great to see you, you know. And um, I, couldn't, I couldn't keep up with them, but we were all out there doing as best we could do. And they were very motivational. One guy in particular was a volunteer coach, and he was really old. He was 50. <laughs> when you're 19, somebody yeah. who's 50 is old. And he felt sorry for me and ran with me every day, jogged with me, and kept telling me stories about the Boston Marathon. And as it turns out, he at 50 had kind of given it away, but still jogged and told me of the good old days when he had run 15 Boston marathons. Well, he just regaled me with these amazing stories so that I was fired up and, and I said, well, I want to run the Boston marathon too. And we had realized by this time that I wasn't as fast as the guys, but I could go as long as anybody. And, and so he said, well, no, a woman actually can't run the Boston marathon. He didn't believe it that a woman could do that kind of distance and said to me after we argued um, that if I showed him in practice that, that that I could run the distance, he'd be the first person to take me. 
So I was now given a challenge oh, by, boy. by somebody I was training with. And the day we ran our 26.2 miles in practice, I didn't believe we had gone long enough. And I said, come on, let's go for, an, for another uh, five miles. And he said, you can run another five miles. And I said, sure. So we wound up running 31 miles that day. And he fainted at the end of the workout. And oh that was our eureka moment. That's when both of us knew that women had something very special when it came to endurance and stamina. And I was full of confidence and he was full of wonder. And um, and I used to joke with him. I said, you know, every day we're out running, you're, you're like the old sailors who think you're going to fall off the earth and go into the monsters off the edge of the earth. And I feel like Magellan. <laughs> There's a difference here. Anyway, he helped me register for the Boston Marathon. What there was, a story. It is a story, wonderful story. There was nothing in the rule book that forbid women to run. It, nothing said it was a men's only race. Nothing on the entry form about gender. Um, because they assumed no so, woman would so, want to go. Well, not only would they not want to go, but they, 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 it just would never occur to them that a woman could possibly do such a thing. And women themselves believed they couldn't do things. You know, we were told all kinds of myths, you know, that your uterus was going to fall out if you did anything <laughs> arduous, that you were never, you were going to turn into a man and grow hair in your chest and become all bulky and muscular. Oh, so most right. women, of course, would never even participate in sports and fitness. They'd be too afraid of it. And I felt great and I looked good too. You know, I was really lean and, and um, attractive and, mm -hmm. and I felt that the sports made me better. And uh, so no amount of convincing could get other women to do it, but the guys were wonderful. So what the hell did I care? I, anyway, we, we signed up. But now here's the trick of the story, uh, which isn't, it was not intentional to defraud anybody, but I signed my name with my initials, K.V. Switzer. Mm -hmm. And that's because my dad misspelled my name on my birth certificate. He was a very motivating guy, but a lousy speller. Um, <laughs> and so it was constantly misspelled. So at a very early age, wanting to be a great writer, like J.D. Salinger or T.S. Eliot, I began signing my name K.V. Switzer. Ah. So these series of coincidences you couldn't possibly repeat. And they award, you know, gave me a bib number. And we went up to Boston with some team members and we picked up our, our bibs. And now the series of coincidences really continue because it was snowing and sleeting, headwind, terrible conditions. So we all looked alike in the starting area with these baggy gray sweatsuits on. Um, I had on lipstick and eyeliner, <laughs> but, but the, then the guys all knew I was a woman and they just loved it. They said, I wish my wife would run. I wish my girlfriend would run. Uh -huh. And it wasn't until a mile into the race when the officials went by on the press truck that they, the camera people were going crazy that there was a woman in the race and the race director just lost his temper, completely lost it, ran down the street after me screaming at me, get the hell out of my race and grab me and tried to throw me back and pull off my bib numbers. Oh. Um, and my coach was screaming, leave her alone. She's okay. I've trained her. And um, he smacked my coach away and came back after me. But my boyfriend, who was a 235 pound all-American football player, deck the official <laughs> oh so the pictures the pictures of this mm -hmm, incident were mm -hmm. were flashed around the world even before i finished the race it was amazing mm -hmm. anyway it was a it was a terrible moment it was a terrible terrible moment but i made the decision how at age 20 with that kind of pressure i don't know but i made the decision to finish the race and i remember telling my coach that i was going to finish this race on my hands and my knees if i had to and I knew, I knew then that if I didn't, everybody would believe women were barging into places where they weren't welcome, oh couldn't goodness. do it. So uh, much responsibility. Yeah, it was. But my dad had already said, hey, you know, you're going to start something, you better finish it. And plus, I knew I could do it. I mean, I'd run 31 miles the, mm. two weeks before. So how does a 20-year-old deal with... Um, not only doing something no woman had ever done, but getting international attention for that. Well, first of all, I knew other women in history had, but nobody believed them. There was even a woman at Boston who jumped out of the bushes and ran the race. And so I, I didn't think I was doing anything unusual. 
And it was my coach who insisted I sign up. He said, you have to sign up. It's a big race. It's a serious race. You got to follow the rules. I thought you could just kind of go in and jump into these things. But he said, are you kidding? This is like the Olympic Games. You can't do that. And I said, OK, OK. So um, so I knew that other women had done it. And so I wasn't there to prove anything. I was there as a reward to run. So all of a sudden, that, that was being taken away from me. I knew I could do it. and um, and And I knew if I dropped out, though, that they would say that I was a clown, that I was a fake, um, and I, ha I had to do it. And how at 20 that I had the confidence was probably because I had been running since I was 12, and I had this, this armor, you know, for, for many years. That was my, my go-to thing. It was, you know, gave me my sense of, of fearlessness and strength. So, so you came back to SU after the Boston Marathon, still as a student? Yes, we had to drive back late that night. In fact, didn't get home until like two in the morning. And um, so I had to show up for class the next day and Arnie had to deliver the mail because he was the university mailman. That's my coach. <laughs> we all had we all had classes. And um, and of course, if there's a pandemonium, you know, the phone was ringing off the hook in the dorm and all my my roommates were running around saying, oh, my God, you did this. It, it, all this happened. And, and of course, at you know, for a while, a lot of people just laughed at it because, you know, girl runs and girl is saved by burly boyfriend. So the hero of the story for, for a long time was not me. It was my boyfriend for decking the official. <laughs> but, you know, I knew, I knew when I saw um, the newspapers from around the world, it was just everywhere, that this was going to be very, very important. And um, it was going to change sports and probably change my life. Um, but it also was very important for me to use the moment, to use that for active change. And instead of regarding it as a funny thing, I said, listen, it's time we change these rules. And I worked very hard on that. I ran in many races. I formed clubs. And then eventually it became my career because I not only became a good runner, I became a very good runner, actually. I won the New York City Marathon and, and posted a world-class time. But I then organized a global series, went and got big-time sponsorship from Avon Cosmetics, organized a global series of women's races that eventually had 400 races in 27 countries. And mm -hmm. I lobbied the International Olympic Committee to get the women's marathon in the Olympic Games and was successful by 1984. Now, that sounds like a long time, but in terms of the International Olympic Committee, um, which moves at a glacial pace, this was, was warp speed. Um, and it was huge. I mean, that was, this was now a social revolution. It wasn't just about women running. It was about um, women doing things and being allowed to do things that previously were, were not only denied to them, but were shrouded in suspicion and um, myth. And women had to overcome that, and we did. And now they're, they're, the happy part of the story, and there are many happy parts of the story now, is that 58% 50, of all participating runners in the United States are women. Mm -hmm. I find that phenomenal. That's happened in my lifetime. And I say, listen, they're, they're not running to be Olympic athletes. They're running because they are empowered. That 20 minutes a day or whatever they have, um, gives them a sense of self-esteem and courageousness um, that they've never had before. And maybe they haven't had it for thousands and thousands of years. So it's a really important, a really important thing uh, for women. And it's, it's beyond running, but it is just sim symptomatic of, of the opportunities that we can give to people and create for people uh, and allow them to emerge and even bloom. Mm -hmm. Hey, Zestful Agers. Last year, I attended the International Federation on Aging's Global Conference in Toronto, and they've announced the 15th Global Conference on Aging for Niagara Falls, Ontario, from November 1st through 3rd, 2020. Zestful Aging Podcast is a proud partner for this conference, and I encourage you to all consider attending. The conference 
features prominent experts presenting and discussing critical issues within the field of aging. So head on over to ifa2020.org to learn more. And I hope to see you in Niagara Falls in November. And that's what 2621 Fearless is? Is that... The internet, uh, the international movement. Yes, that... well, that's that's the next great, wonderful step, and it's a little scary for me. It's interesting that it's called fearless because um, sometimes <laughs> it get it makes me afraid because it's the first thing I've ever done that probably isn't going to reach fruition um, until after I'm dead. Um, because this is a movement and a foundation, a nonprofit named after my old bib number, two six one, that the official tried to tear off of me in the race. Um, that number suddenly, about six years ago, started becoming this magic number. People were writing to me and saying, that number makes me feel fearless, and I'm wearing it on my back tomorrow in a race, or oh, I'm wow. inking, inking it on my wrist, or when they when they started tattooing themselves. Oh, God, I know. I'm getting chills. I got, well, I got chills on that. I got, oh. I got creeps when I started seeing the tattoos. Because what did it mean? What did it mean? What did it mean? And what is the synchronicity here? What's the, what's the universe telling me? And I'm not a crystals, magnets, and hoodoo, voodoo person. So this was tough for me to, to, to figure out until I suddenly realized, you know what? Everybody listening right now and everybody in the whole world has been told at one time or the other they're not good enough or they don't belong or they're the wrong race or wrong color or the wrong religion or they don't make enough money or they're not cool or you're too fat, or you're too slow, you don't belong. And you go and you run, and you feel fearless, and damn, you knew, you know you can do anything. And that's what it really means. And I said, holy cow, we've got to harness this. And we created a nonprofit now that goes around the world creating educational programs, a communications network, and a series of community clubs that get women together to take the first step. And we use running and walking as the means and it's non-competitive it's totally social totally non-judgmental and if you can get somebody just to get outside get away with other people and mm. and get a sense of reinforcement as you know as a therapist for god's sakes um that's that's what will help them take the first step to their own sense of well-being wow that's what 261 fearless is all about we'd love to have you all join us. It's mm -hmm. you find out more at two six one fearless dot org org dot oh, org. I will put that in the notes. Yeah, please do and form a community club. Um, join us as a friend. Follow us. You know, um, we we're already in eleven countries and we're only two two years old. Mm -hmm. So, I'm I'm excited about it um, because um, just as surely as uh, we've changed women's lives through running um, from this story. Um, I think the next step is going to be 261 Fearless. We're going to hopefully get, a, get to a lot of those ladies behind burkas or in North Africa, um, those women in Kenya who are carrying water on their head, or um, maybe your next door neighbor, mm -hmm. because your next door neighbor might be just as fearless as those other women. This is really an example of turning the adversity of what happened at the Boston Marathon into this amazing, positive movement. Well, you know, Nicole, everybody has an opportunity to take pick up a piece of social injustice and make it right. You know, you can't change the whole world, but maybe you can do something in your own backyard. And um, most people walk away from it. And um, it's, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard to take responsibility and pick it up. You know, we're all busy. We're all busy getting, mm. taking selfies. And ah. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. Think about it, everybody. You're busy taking selfies mm. when maybe there's a kid that's getting kind of, you know, harassed and, and is, is been told he's not good enough. When you, all you have to do is say, add a boy or add a girl. I know you can do it. And just give them that little little bit of little bit of self esteem. That's all it takes. Mm -hmm. Is there any time where you kind of unplug from this responsibility you feel of changing the world and just sit and do a crossword puzzle? Or I wish, and I've got to start doing something like that. I actually find that on the run. Um, 
running is just the hub of my life from that point of view. It busts my stress. It gives me a sense of perspective. It calms me. It gives me, you know, as I say, myself again. And, um, and right now I've got a, a tweaky calf muscle, which is preventing me from getting out and running. And I, and I know when I have my scary dreams and my, <laughs> all these things, it's just that I just need to go for a good run. And I think, um, everybody has their own method. I love to read and I do take, I do take 15, 20 minutes a day just to, to, to read, which is, I'm instantly lost in space. <laughs> but running is the thing for me. Movement and nature is um, mm. very, very uh, life saving for everyone. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk a little bit about now at the age of 72? You want to talk about aging and some of your perspective? Sure. Uh, it's an important thing to bring up, particularly with older women. Uh, I, I find a lot of older women are very, very afraid of getting old. Um, and yet, you know, the alternative is terrible. So, so let's try to make the best of this. And really, um, one of my sponsors is Humana and, and they, partner with me uh, in a program of active aging because they know and I know and, and hopefully many, many more people know the more active you are, the stronger and healthier and happier and more optimistic um, you're going to be. Um, movement does that. Now, I am very grateful for my good health, honestly. Um, I ran the Boston Marathon again in 2017 on the 50th anniversary of my first run. And it was the happiest day of my life because I was surrounded by women wearing bibs, 13,500 of them when I was the only one 50 years before. And the positivity along the course was fantastic. I also had a good race. It was really, really great. And I thought, you know, what we have to do is show people that, that they really can defy expectations about aging. And mm. people, people tell you when you get older that you should slow down and take it easy and sit on the sofa, when in fact that's the worst thing you can do because mm -hmm. we need to keep active and socialized and we need to keep moving. Um, you know, use it or lose it. Keep That's those parts right. well oiled. That's right. And um, and so that is important for me to get that message out. And it's it's one I believe so strongly in. And you know, any time I I trip or fall down or or uh, or tweak a, a calf muscle like I just did, I say, oh, man, it's because I'm getting older. And I'm saying, don't be an ageist. That can happen to you, and it's happened to you plenty when you were 25. <laughs> But really, I do want, I do encourage people to get moving and, and to keep happy. Do you have any other advice for, for a post, we'll say postmenopausal women, for what they can do to keep healthy and well? Sure. Put on your sneakers and go out the door. That's, <laughs> it's just that simple. Honestly, it really, really is. Um, and get together with, uh, if possible, with a group of other women um, and also give back. You know, a lot of the times I find that it's um, it's just as rewarding for me to help somebody else get started than it is for me to particularly participate. Um, you, we talked earlier about the senior games, the national senior games. Mm -hmm. um, that is really a lot of fun. Um, mm -hmm. You have to be 50, um, but the oldest competitor, remember Julia Hawkins, 103. Gosh, mm -hmm. she was sharp as a tack, too. Um, and, um, and pick something you like doing doesn't have to be running uh it can be walking or badminton or pickleball or swimming mm -hmm. bicycling there are 20 different sports in the national senior games mm -hmm. maybe you don't like sports okay so get get busy and play bridge but honestly you really do need to do something every day to keep your body in motion that's very very important and i stress getting outside because really air and sun and trees and mm -hmm. grass all of those things the earth gives you back so much if you just give it a, a few minutes. And I understand that you are not um, someone who restricts particular foods or goes on 
uh, diet. Res- Absolutely. Di- okay. Not. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. I mean, I make a joke about myself. I say I'm on a seafood diet. If I see food, mm-hmm. I eat it. Mm-hmm. You know, food is to be enjoyed and savored with friends. And um, uh, I have a wide, wide variety of food. I don't restrict myself on anything. But, but you know, I, d- I don't naturally, I don't overeat, but I just eat till I'm, I'm no longer hungry. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I don't overthink it. Food is fuel. I mean, at a very basic level, food is what keeps you going. Your car does not drive without gasoline. Well, unless you can plug it in someplace. So, <laughs> but the, the body, <laughs> the body essentially is the same. Um, but, um, this can be a celebration rather than a sense of guilt or denial. And don't overcomplicate it. You know, nature made us omnivorous for a reason. So. <laughs> It's just well that simple. said. <laughs> well said. Now I know you have a book signing. Do you want to uh, tell us about your book? Uh, sure. Um, it's interesting. Um, I'm going to be signing t- uh, a, a book signing tonight. When I've done this quite a bit, actually, oh, along with my husband Roger Robinson, who is a very noted um, and, and very very wonderful writer, and his book is When Running Made History. And Roger is older too. I'm 72. He's 80. And his book is a, a look back on um, amazing running events that have changed or uh, evoked an era in, in our histories that are very, very important. Let's say running the Berlin Marathon at the time of reunification in the 90s. Mm. Okay, That was huge. That's a very good example. My book is Marathon Woman. And it is a memoir um, starting with you know my very early beginnings in running. Uh, uh, through the Boston Marathon experience and the bigger picture of what that meant and ending with getting the women's marathon in the Olympic Games. Well, that that is 84. Well, we're now already at 2019. So clearly it's time for another book. But my mm-hmm. book is beyond running. It's not about how to or anything else, but it explains why it's important and why women are excited about it. But it's also very funny. And there's plenty of beer, sex, and rock and roll in it to keep anybody <laughs> happy. So, <laughs> so enjoy Marathon Woman. Uh, and you can get these things at a bookstore or online at Amazon or whatever. And where can people find you online? You mentioned 261fearless.org. Are there any other places they sure. might find my you? Sure. My own website is marathonwoman.com. And that's really easy to remember. And uh, you'll find out where I am and what's doing. And, uh, and, and there's very interesting tips and, and all kinds of things going on on that website. Mm-hmm. Great fun. And do you plan to be in Fort Lauderdale? In, uh, uh, absolutely. Okay. Well, I'm looking forward to meeting you then. Then we'll be there together. That'll be really <laughs> great. I think we're in different age categories and different sports. Um, yes. But I did the 5K uh, this year and hopefully in... Uh, in Fort Lauderdale, I'll be back up to doing both the 5K and the 10K. Mm, well, I'll be very grateful that it's not high altitude tennis because that was wreaking havoc with the balls and uh, it was a bit of a train wreck. But <laughs> the uh, the overall experience was fabulous. The actual time on the court was pretty frustrating. Yes, I heard that. And But, yeah. you know, for a runner, the altitude in, in Albuquerque ah. was hard as well. Yes. Um, and I was really pretty tired and breathless when I finished. Um, mm-hmm. But hey, uh, we may have some heat in Fort Lauderdale, but uh, at this time of the year, we should be fine. We should be fine. Catherine, it has been such an honor and a pleasure to speak with you today. Thank you so much for your time and sharing your sense of humor and your passion with us. Thank you so much, Nicole. And good luck with this wonderful podcast. And congratulations to everybody out there listening. Get your sneakers on and get moving. Thank you so much for joining us on Zestful Aging. If you like the podcast, please share it with some of your friends. I love to hear from my listeners. Send me an email at NicoleChristina.com. In this phase of our lives, we're more aware that our time is precious, and we certainly don't want to waste it taking care of stuff that we no longer need, left over from a life that we are no longer living. We know we would feel better with less clutter and more open space, but we don't know how to get there. 
If this sounds familiar, I'd love you to check out the online course I've developed with professional organizer and designer, Carrie Luteran. This course is different than others you may have tried because we give you clear steps to deal with the clutter and tools to help you face the overwhelm and feelings that come up when you're going through your clutter. It's practical and realistic, and the lessons are short and punchy and very manageable, but it has the power to change your life. We all deserve to live in a peaceful home without the chaos of too much stuff. Find out more at NicoleChristina.com. Next week, we're going to speak with Jolene Hill. Her motto is life is short, so let's talk. And she's developed these really innovative conversation cards. They're actually beautiful, and they're used all over the world in different clinics to help people with dementia and other cognitive decline start conversations. She really believes in the importance of creating a record of our lives journey for future generations. So, see you then. 